Hello, everyone, and welcome to this next installment of Child Life in Action. As you know, this is our video interview series where we chat with child life specialists who are approaching child life as well as the pandemic in unique and innovative ways and to just get some new ideas, new things to think about that we can all bring to our practice. Today, I am pleased to be joined by the chairs of the Diversity Task Force, Divna and Rochelle, and I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves to get started. Okay. Um, I'll go first. I'm Michelle Porter, Director of Childish Services and Creative Arts Therapies at Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. As you mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, Task Force, as well as a uh, Fearless Living Life Coach. Um, so, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this interview today. Great. And I'm Devna Wheelwright. I'm the Manager of Child Life and Creative Arts Therapy at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland in Oakland, California. Fortunate enough to be uh, Rochelle's co-lead for the DEI task force, as mentioned. And again, just so grateful for the, um, the platform and the opportunity today. Great. Well, so just to kind of give everyone some background knowledge that might not be as familiar with your task force, it is one of our newer um, groups. Can you tell us a little bit about your task force and kind of the goals that your group is working towards? Sure. So I think, um, you know, broadly, this is a task force that's been charged with promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion across all aspects of um, ACLP and the field of child life, which I think requires a really hard look at our existing infrastructure. And, um, you know, we've got an incredible group of um, members uh, from very diverse backgrounds. And uh, the first project that we've sunk our teeth into is the creation of a position statement. Um, so really looking critically at, you know, what is the future state that we aspire to? Um, what language are we using to describe that future state? And how are we really ensuring that um, pathways of entry into child life are equitable, that, um, you know, the training, the curriculum that we are holding specialists to um, is equitable and uh, actually inclusive of multiple voices and, and realities. Um, and we've um, now been working for what, Rochelle? Six months, seven months? Yeah, six, seven months. Yeah, like Dina said, like we have a diverse group. Um, we're very fortunate to have members that were part of the initial task force that we had years ago. So we have that past history. But, you know, as we know, um, diversity, equity, inclusion issues are ongoing. We should always be talking about it. Um, so I think we've had some great dialogue, you know, coming together and putting together the position statement. Um, and, and like Dina said, really looking at, you know, current state and like where we want to go. What's our vision? What are we committed to? Um, so I think we've had some really good discussions and we'll bring that forth to the, the position statement forth, forth to the board and then see where it goes from there. But I think it's, you know, collectively, what are we all going to do as child life specialists um, when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion with the patients and families that we work with? Um, and, you know, what's our commitment to that? Great. So I know, you know, one of the goals you guys are working towards, you know, just the processes and pathways to becoming a child life specialist, making sure that's open, equitable, inclusive. But you guys, your group has also been really great about bringing to light um, kind of some of the broader, more systemic issues impacting healthcare that it's important as child life specialists for us to be aware of um, and how those issues can impact, you know, the experience of children and families from different backgrounds have within the healthcare system. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, I think, you know, I think um, when we think about healthcare, you know, in the, state, in the United States, there's a lot of healthcare um, disparities. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, COVID-19 probably just brought that to light even more, but it's always been um, part of our country's history. So I think you know, now people are more talking about, you know, how patients or families are affected by COVID, but really looking at the, the, the structural um, systems that have been created that kind of have caused some of the reasons that we have the healthcare disparities that we have today. I mean, when you look at COVID-19, I think about, you know, families who, you know, right now their parents um, are not working um, financially, you know, are can't meet basic needs. I mean, and you know, like food. I mean, there's so many stories about families right now 
who are on line for food pantries and don't have food to eat. And food is part of health and well-being. So not being able to have food will affect your health and well-being, um, as an example. Um, so even though you probably have some other examples too as well that we're seeing. Yeah, I was I was happy to talk to you earlier today, Rochelle, because I feel like we were mentioning this could be, you know, a multi-part series. I mean, there's so yeah. much. Where do we start? I mean, honestly, I I feel like we've got 400 years of structural inequities to reckon with um, when we talk about this present day topic um, through the lens of COVID-19. So yeah, I think to put it really bluntly, you know, what we're seeing are is essentially structural problems within the American system that are resulting in people of color being killed. So when you're seeing these health disparities, what you're really seeing is racism in action. Um, and in a way that's very simple. So um, I think that, that when you look at the, the trajectory of this virus, what you'll see is that, you know, the, the areas of super spread, you know, just for one example, can be attributed to densely populated areas. So members who are curious about this, just Google Rikers Island, you know, for one example, um, you know, COVID-19 is current, currently ravaging prisons across this country. And, you know, who who's in those prisons currently? So um, we know that people of color make up two thirds of um, the American population um, who's incarcerated. So I, I think there's so much to say, which, you know, which populations are more likely to live in densely populated areas. All of this generates health disparities. And as I said, ultimately, it's, you know, because of a 400 year old history of racist policies. So, you know, it's, it's not, a new, like it's even to say it's not a new issue, I think that it's just coming to light. So one thing I would say to Charlotte specialists that, you know, if they're not aware of these issues, they should become more aware of them and that how it's affecting the patients and families that we work with every day. So you could have a child that you're seeing that has been affected in some way based on different healthcare disparities. They are, you know, their parent could be within the prison system. Um, you know, also their parent could be one of the people of color who have, you know, diabetes or high blood pressure, all these precursor things that we're seeing more and more patients that have COVID-19. And again, that child, that family is affected by that. Um, and, you know, it's really important for us when we're making our assessments that we're really being able to talk to families and understand, you know, what is what are they experiencing, seeing it through their lens, not through our own, um, not what we think they need, but really finding out what that family, that patient needs, and, you know, what is the strength of that family? How is, you know, how can that family use those strengths to support them during this time? And how can we help support them based on what they need and based on their strength? Um, I think it's very important. I think you've given, you're giving us a lot to think about, especially with some of these ways that, um, you know, these health disparities manifest and a good reminder to, you know, to kind of step outside of our own perspective. It can be tempting to fall into that um, trap of thinking everyone experiences the world the same way, you know, we do ourselves. And just a, a good reminder for all of us, especially during a unprecedented time um, to, you know, kind of take that step back and look at some of these larger systemic issues. Um, Rochelle, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to maybe dive into it a little bit more. What are the things that we as child life specialists can do to address some of these things? Um, I'll admit, sometimes when I think about it, it seems so big and so systemic that, you know, how do I as one person m make a change? Um, so I'd just be curious to hear from both of you, you know, some of the kind of concrete things we can do as child life specialists. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, one person, you know, making a change, right, it's a big, it's a huge issue. But I think that, you know, I think we have to go beyond that and realize that we have to make some change. I think, you know, asking yourself, like, what are you committed to do differently today? Um, one of the, someone had said to me once that with COVID, how do you want to be now during this pandemic? And how do you want to be better after this pandemic? So I feel like as child especially, that's what we really need to start thinking about. You know, 
really doing the research, you know, it's simple to Google and learn about healthcare disparities that are happening in America, learning about the history of what, why we are where we are today, but also then thinking about how we can change that. Um, and, you know, really, you know, sometimes it, you know, it's kind of challenging because it requires you to really look at yourself and realize that maybe, you know what, I've actually been seeing the world a little bit differently than what is really happening to others and, you know, how it's affecting other people. But also, I feel like it's our ethical responsibility as child specialists that, you know, we kind of said when we became child specialists that we want to be advocates for patients and families and we want to help them. And I think this is part of the advocacy is really learning about the patients and families that we truly learning about them not what we think we know about them, but really learning about it from their perspective, from their lens um, to better help them. And I, I think a lot of it is doing a lot of self-work um, and kind of doing that stepping back. You know, there are webinars, there's tons of books, there's so much information out there. I think um, if people are um, going to be a part of the ACLP conference, there's gonna be a lot of, um, you know, um, sessions that will deal with some of these issues as a starting point. But if you if you don't attend the conference, um, I mean, as I read an article last week in the New York Times talking about health disparities in America that was going on with COVID-19, which had a lot of links to, you know, uh, the 1619 Project. There's so many things, so many resources. I think that um, you just have to take the time and, and ask. Um, and and um, it's out there. The resources are available to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rochelle, I, I, I want to underscore that. I think, um, you know, it, it bears saying that, you know, even in asking the question, you know, what can we do? It's 2020. It's 2020. So in my mind, if you don't know the answer at that point, especially given what Rochelle just said, that there's so much information out there, there's so much opportunity to invest in education and to invest in reparations and to learn from really formidable scholars, leaders. Um, I think if you haven't taken that opportunity, you really need to think about that because I don't think it's too far of a leap to then, you know, conclude that you haven't felt any real urgency to answer that question. What can I do? So it definitely starts with, um, you know, a self-interrogation and I think being willing to, you know, see yourself clearly, which includes being a, a flawed person, being a biased person, being so a racist the person. Discomfort. Yeah. Um, the, the choice to avoid the discomfort is um, a perfect example of, of privilege. And I think that that's an especially dangerous thing to think about, um, especially given the, you know, the work of child life specialists, given that we have the amazing privilege of being able to work with some of the most vulnerable populations that exist. Um, people who are scared, people who've experienced significant trauma, people who are oppressed. And if you as a provider aren't investing in that self-work and that lifelong commitment to self-interrogation, you're part of the problem. You know, that's, I, I really, you know, I hope people walk away today with some recognition that, um, you know, if you make the choice to not look closely at this data, to look at how um, COVID-19 is really ravaging certain communities and not others, you're choosing to be apathetic, which actually, you know, in my mind, puts you on the side of, of the oppressor, certainly doesn't do anything to help those who are being um, hurt. So think about what that means. I guess that's that's a place to start. All right, well, I think we're just getting close to the end of our time here. Is there anything else you wanted to share with the child life community um, before, we, before we wrap up? Rochelle, could we talk about Ahmaud Arbery? from this morning, just that point that she made about, you know, how we know, you know, I, I think that it's clear now that coronavirus is not impacting children in the same way that it's impacting adults, um, but how that's really not a pass for us as a field to not be focusing in on the law, you know, the large scale ramifications of these inequities. What do you think, Rochelle? Can you yeah, I think that, you know, like, you know, we work with children and not, we're not seeing as much with children as of yet, but we are starting to see some um, kids, you know, have COVID and certain um, 
different things I know listening about kids who have COVID that we didn't realize before. But I think that it's really important that, you know, we realize that these children are still affected because they have family members who have been affected by COVID-19. So to think that like maybe the child in the bed maybe not doesn't have the disease or the virus, but they are being affected in some way. Um, you think about it, like kids right now are doing remote learning for the first time ever because they can't go to, they're unable to go to school. And, you know, the equity in that is even if there are some children actually, one, didn't have a device, so the schools are giving them devices. And some children, you know, families don't have internet. That's not a priority for them. Um, it's, you know, it's a priority of other things that they need to manage and not even being able to have that properly. So that's affecting their education. A lot of children, you know, um, depend on um, the school for meals. Um, and now they're not able to get those meals because they're not attending school. So like it's affecting kids in a lot of different ways. And again, like I mentioned, a lot of families, you know, um, unfortunately are doing the right thing. They're staying in because um, they're not allowed to work. So that's also affecting the family um, unit as well. Um, and, you know, access to services. And I think that, you know, you know, one thing I want child specialists to, from this you know, interview is to really think about do I really know that child who's actually sitting in the bed? Do I really know that family who's actually there? And, you know, do, you know, do I actually take the time to listen, not to hear what they're saying, but truly listen with an understanding, you know, active listening, the understanding of what their experience is and how, how they need to be supported through this crisis. And, and it goes beyond COVID-19 because COVID-19 is just, what is one virus of many medical um, issues that are going to happen to patients and families every single day? Healthcare disparities that are happening are happening every single day. So I don't want us to leave thinking, okay, after COVID nineteen settles down, this issue's gone. So you know this continues on, and that you know, child specialists, we are advocates, and really think about what that means and how you can truly be an advocate for patients. That's a great point about, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about let's just get back to normal, but getting back to normal would mean going back to this not being as forefront of a conversation as it has been recently, especially with the health disparities piece of it. And with what you mentioned with education, I, there are definitely some concerns about widening the achievement gap because of lack of access to some of these online learning opportunities that have been created. So. Yeah, not going back to normal, but staying in a more conscious place as, you know, the world starts to reopen, maybe. And also thinking about what, what normal means to different people, because going back to normal means, you know, very, very vividly for some, you know, being one second away from racial terrorization at all times. I mean, that's normal. So I just think that's that's something for us to be you know, conscious of as well. And I think um, I've been just paying close attention to the themes that are coming up on the forum and what people are posting about. And, you know, I've, I've been grateful to participate um, as a listener in some of the, you know, the roundtable discussions among program leaders and how um, leaders are really messaging their teams and, and what we need to be aware of. And I've heard, you know, a lot of talk about, you know, certainly children being at higher risk in these times of isolation and, and losing critical milestones. And I've heard a lot of conversation about, you know, how do we operationalize services in this new reality? I've been struck that we haven't heard any conversation about this, about these health disparities, about the, you know, the manifestations of structural racism. And I think that, you know, if we as child life specialists are going to call ourselves developmentalists, are going to call ourselves assessors, are going to call ourselves family-centered care providers, and we're not doing the work of paying attention to the impact of environment, that's not at the dead center of everything we do. I think that's highly problematic. Well, thank you both for taking the time to have this conversation. Um, to everyone listening, thank you for taking the time to kind of open, open up your mind a little bit, maybe take on some new perspectives. I hope for those of you um, that are going to be joining us for the virtual conference that take this to heart and um, take advantage of some of the diversity-focused um, learning opportunities available through that conference. 
this is a big conversation and one that's not easy. Um, so I, you know, the whole idea of leaning into the discomfort, I think is an important one to remember and um, it's not going away. So thank you, Steve and Rochelle, always wonderful to talk to you. I always learn something talking to you. Um, and to everyone else, we'll see you for the next Child Life in Action. <laughs>